This is Ray Bonsolder. Welcome back to the Angel of the Abyss. This by Mark Goodwin, a great book, chapter 6, and he begins with Psalm 91, 11, and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Absolute exhaustion hit Everest as he tossed the last shovel of dirt out of the hole, which would be Kevin's grave. He had volunteered to do the digging so Courtney could help Sarah with getting Kevin cleaned up. Sarah selected the peaceful resting place near the Bear River, just a few hundred yards from the staging area where they were to meet Tommy and the rest of his crew. Everett looked toward the park entrance as he climbed out of the hole. No one from Tommy's team was back yet. Well, they should have been back hours ago. Everett walked over to the edge of the river and rinsed his face and hands, being careful not to get any of the water in his eyes or mouth. Arsenic levels out west were nowhere near as high as they were back home, but he still wanted to limit his exposure. Everett carried his shovel back to the truck where Sarah sat with Kevin's head resting in her lap. Are you ready? No. Sarah stared at Kevin's face. But I probably never will be. So we can go ahead. Besides, the more I look at him like this, the harder it will be to remember him as he was. Okay. Everett's voice was solemn. I'll drive the truck over to the grave site. You and Courtney can stay in the bank with Kevin. Sarah nodded as she stroked Kevin's hair. Everett drove the truck to the pit in the earth. Then he walked to the rear of the vehicle and opened the small Bible they had carried. He read the 23rd Psalm, then prayed for God to comfort Sarah. Next, he and Courtney and Sarah used several strands of paracord to lower Kevin's body down into the hole. Sarah stared blankly at the grave and then began to weep bitterly as Everett started to fill it back up with the dirt that he had excavated just a short while earlier. Once the grave was covered, Sarah asked, Do you do you mind if I stay here alone until Tommy and the others return? Well, not at all. We'll be over by the pavilion if you need us. Courtney gave her a hug and then got into the truck with Everett. Once back to the staging area, Everett and Courtney ate two MREs. You look tired, Courtney said as she ate. It's been a long day. We won, she said. We accomplished what we came here to do. Well, this victory doesn't seem very sweet. Everett continued eating because he had to, not because he wanted to. Even if he knew it would be the last thing he ever did, Kevin would do it all over again. He'd see it as a win. I think we owe it to him to acknowledge the success. We owe it to Kevin to keep on living our lives. She took his hand, and we owe it to each other. Everett turned to her and smiled. Yep, yep, yep you're right. He set the rest of his meal on the tailgate and hugged her. I'm so glad I've still got you. That evening, the sun set behind the mountains to the west, and Tommy's team still did not return. Everett finished securing the fuel tank trailer to the back of the water tank trailer, which was hitched to the Dodge crew cab. He looked up to see Courtney returning from the gravesite alone. Is she all right? She's fine. 
but she wants to sleep there tonight. She'll never get a chance to visit his grave again. Well, I can understand that. Everett knew they'd all be reunited in less than four years, but that fact wouldn't have eased his sorrow if it had been Courtney who died, so he wouldn't act as if it should for Sarah. How long will we wait for Tommy tomorrow? Well, the agreement was 24 hours, so just after sunrise, Everett hurried to get the gas drained from the truck they'd taken on the raid. He wanted to finish before dark. They must have gotten in some real trouble. They had a shorter drive than we did. Courtney helped him by pouring the gasoline into the fuel trailer and returning the receptacles to Everett. Tommy would give us a little more time if we weren't back by dawn. Well, we can wait until noon, but if they're not back by then, it's likely that not one of them survived. The next morning, Everett read his Bible, then prayed that God would bring Tommy and the others back safely. Courtney took an MRE to Sarah down by the river and then returned. The morning hours inched by as Everett kept watch for Tommy. Finally, Courtney said, It's noon. I, I, I guess we should get going, huh? Everett nodded in disappointment. I'll go tell Sarah it's time to go. Courtney headed toward the river one last time. Everett evaluated the items they were taking with them and the ones they were leaving behind. He wanted to be sure they had everything that might be of value in case they got the opportunity to trade for gas. But at the same time, he didn't want to carry extra weight that would cause them to expend additional fuel. Everett heard a faint clip-clop in the distance. It took a moment for the subtle sound to register in his mind. Horses. Everett drew his rifle and looked to see who was coming. He saw two riders near the park entrance. One was large in stature. He lifted his rifle to look through the scope. Tommy! Everett lowered the weapon and sprinted toward his buddy. He soon recognized Preacher as being the other rider. Thanks for waiting, Tommy yelled as they drew closer. Well, where's everybody else? Dead. Preacher slung his leg over the saddle and stepped down. All of them. Devon. Jeb. Michael. Everybody. Tommy's horse looked like it was ready to drop. But Tommy looked worse. Are either of you injured? Everett looked them over for apparent wounds. No, Tommy slowly got down from the horse. But I sure could do with some water. Of course, you're probably hungry, too. Everett led the two men back toward the vehicles. Did you shut it down? Tommy asked. We cut the water pipe but pumps. I've scrolled through the radio stations a few times, but I can't pick anything up, so I don't have any way of confirming that Dragon is down. Everett offered filled canteens to Tommy and Preacher. How's your team? Tommy took a long drink. Kevin was killed. The rest of us made it out. Courtney and Sarah arrived back at the truck. Is everyone else coming? Preacher finished his canteen and gave it to Everett to refill. We hit the base hard and took off. Well, we made it back into the mountains and thought we were home free. But then four Humvees caught us. They shot out our tires, 
so he had to stick Tommy's truck in the ditch and take off into the mountains. Everyone else was gunned down. The peacekeepers finally gave up on us, I guess. Tommy tore it into an MRA. Well, if we took down Dragon, they'll resume the search today. They'll widen the parameter, too. We best be getting on our way. Everett nodded. Okay. Let me rig up two more bikes to the cargo rack on the Dodge. Otherwise, we're ready to roll out. Ten minutes later, the team was on the road. Everett drove and Courtney rode shotgun with Sarah in the back seat. Preacher and Tommy slept in the bed of the truck as they'd been traveling all night long. Everett kept the speed at 55, both to watch for potholes and to maximize fuel efficiency. Because of the slower speed, they didn't reach Cheyenne until after dark. They used flashlights to fill the gas tank. Tommy and Preacher drove for the next leg of the journey, while Everett, Courtney, and Sarah slept in the back of the Dodge. Everett woke up after a long ride. The sun was up and the vehicle wasn't moving. He heard voices talking outside. Everett's heart raced and he reached for his gun. He peeked out the window of the side of the topper to see Tommy and Preacher speaking to five well-armed men, all wearing overalls. Everett couldn't make out what they were saying, but the interaction didn't appear to be hostile. He nudged Courtney and Sarah. He whispered, Girls, something's going on outside. I don't think it's trouble, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. Get your guns. Courtney and Sarah each grabbed their weapons. What's happening? Sarah asked. Everett described the scene out the window. Well, Tommy and Preacher don't have their weapons drawn, but neither do the other guys. Tommy is turning his back on them and walking this way. Tommy opened the back window of the topper. Good morning. Everything okay out there? Everett asked cautiously. Better than okay. I'm swapping our excess food, ammo, and weapons for ethanol. Enough to get us home. These fellas started converting their surplus corn into fuel after the initial false flag attacks on the oil refineries way back when. Can you slide all the boxes of MREs except one to me? And I need Courtney's rifle. Everett and Sarah, I need your sidearms. Magazines too, please. Nope, you said extra. That rifle and those two pistols are not extra, Sarah protested. Tommy's reply was patient but direct. They're extra because we'll be home tomorrow instead of next month. Sarah looked at Everett. You've got to tell him we need our weapons to get back safely. Everett looked at Tommy. What weapons are you guys keeping? I'll hang on to my rifle and Preacher will have his pistol. Everyone will still have a firearm for the trip home, but I had to do some heavy negotiating to get the price down to what we have. They wanted all the rifles. Sarah scowled. Well, what about supply and demand? They don't have many customers to sell to. Why can't you ask them to just take the food and extra ammo for trade? Tommy chuckled. Well, the way they understand supply and demand is that there ain't no more corn going to grow in our snake-ridden soil. And on top of that, they see a truck with empty gas tank more than a thousand miles from home. We don't exactly have the strongest hand at the table. Tommy looked at Everett and winked. And on top of it all, it seems the mark payment systems are experiencing some technical difficulties. 
and these folks think that might mean more demand for their fine product. Courtney put her arms around Everett's neck and kissed him on the cheek. We did it. We took down Dragon. Everett took a moment to drink in the elation of success. He then looked at Sarah. I have to agree with Tommy on this one. I'd rather take our chances with a limited amount of firepower. We'll be totally exposed the whole trip home if we have to travel a thousand miles by bike. Not to mention we'll have to choose between carrying food or weapons anyway. And once we get home, we've got an entire cave full of weapons and ammo. Sarah continued to pick the plan apart. Well, this engine won't run on pure ethanol, especially in the winter. Winter ain't gonna matter. We ain't gonna turn the motor off long enough for it to get cold. And I'm not worried about long-term damage. I'm more concerned with getting home than the resale value. Fine. Sarah drew her pistol and passed it to Tommy. Courtney handed Tommy a rifle and spare magazines. This has to be a miracle from God. How did you know they had fuel? Tommy collected the items to be traded. Hand-painted side, sign on the side of the road back there. Said ethanol for serious trade. Everett considered Courtney's words as he passed the remaining boxes to Tommy. She was right. This had to be a gift from the Almighty. Chapter 7 This is Ruth 1, 16 and 17. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. The people, thy people, shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Ruth 1, 16 and 17. The team arrived safely back to Tommy's compound Friday morning. Tommy gave Devon's jeep to Everett to take home from his farm. Everett pulled the distributor cap from the jeep when they reached the landslide area to keep it from being stolen. Then he and the two girls rode across the debris field and back to the cave on the last remaining quad runner. The sun had not yet risen when Everett, Courtney, and Sarah returned to the cave. Everett was exhausted, but he was also filthy. He pushed himself to go through the laborious process of drawing bathing water from the well, which was up the ladder and down a long, narrow corridor. And once there, Everett had to draw the water up by string tied to a five-gallon bucket which was weighted on one side so it would tip over into the water once it reached the well. Next, the water was poured into a funnel, which fed into a series of PVC pipes that the team had scavenged from various places. The pipes used gravity to pull the water through the corridor and down into a 55-gallon drum sitting at the base of the ladder. Once the drum was full, they had water for cooking, drinking, and bathing. If anyone desired something besides the frigid cave water for bathing, heating the water was another long process. And on this day, Everett settled for an icy cat bath. Sarah was more concerned with lack of armaments. Immediately after returning home, she climbed to the storage corridor to dig out replacement pistols, rifles, ammunition, and magazines. 
Courtney plopped down on her sleeping bag and went right to sleep. Everett awoke late Friday evening to the sound of Courtney and Sarah heating water for bathing. The closest thing the cave dwellers had to proper bath facility was a five-gallon camping shower hung around a stalagmite in a remote corner of the cave. An old sheet draped between two more stalagmites served as the shower curtain, and regardless of how hot the shower water was, the surrounding air was piercingly gelid. Courtney took her shower first, then came to the living area of the great room in the cave, referred to by the team as the cathedral. She shivered as she got dressed. Next, she crawled back into her sleeping bag to warm up. I hate going through this in the winter, Everett snickered. <laughs> this cave is a same temperature all year round. It's always cold. She covered her head and mumbled through the sleeping bag. Yeah, but in the summer, you can go outside and warm up. Minutes later, Sarah returned, also shivering. She repeated Courtney's method of getting warm. Everett looked at Kevin's empty spot. Illuminated by the old battery-operated lantern, sitting upon a stack of empty buckets. The five-gallon containers, which had been filled with supplies three years ago, now served as makeshift furniture. Four of them held a panel of plywood, which made a table. Six more buckets surrounded the table for chairs. Moses, Elijah, and Kevin's chairs were now vacant. Everett had to do something to dispel the void left in the dreary cavern created by the absence of his friends. I'm going to go get socks and danger tomorrow. If no one has any objection, I'm going to take ten buckets of food over to Cotton's family. With Jeb and Michael gone, they'll have a tough time surviving. Courtney sat up. I'll go with you. Sarah popped her head out of the covers. Then I'm going too. I can't stay here by myself. I'm not ready for that. Everett understood. Okay. He offered Sarah a smile, but it was more than she could do to return the gesture. What's that? Courtney shined her flashlight at the corner of the cave where Elijah's sleeping area had been. Everett turned to gaze into the dark region of the cavern. A walking stick? No. Courtney crawled out of her sleeping bag and stood up. She walked to the back section of the room and retrieved the object. It's Moses' staff! Like I said, a walking stick, Everett said. Everett, this is the staff he used to part the Red Sea, to call the plague of locusts, to summon the plague of frogs, to bring down hail and darkness on Egypt. She stood mesmerized by the staff. She looked up at Everett and Sarah, and most importantly, to turn water to blood. Everett shook his head. Why do you say most importantly? Because, she exclaimed, Revelation 11 says the two witnesses will have the power to make it not rain, to strike the earth with plagues, and to turn the water to blood. What if Moses needs his staff to turn the water to blood? God gave him that power when he was here before. Elijah had the power to make it not rain, and Moses used his staff to turn the water to blood. Everett, we have to go to Jerusalem. We have to take Moses' staff to him. Everett exhaled deeply and rolled his eyes. He doesn't need his staff. For all we know, he may have left it here for us. She pleaded, Everett, 
You're not being reasonable. Don't you see? He has to have this staff to fulfill the prophecy. Sarah looked on, listening intently. Everett pulled out his Bible and thumbed through the pages to Exodus. What version are you reading the message? The NLT? Because the King James doesn't say anything like that. Everett, I'm reading the New King James, and it's not that different. Her voice sounded insulted as if she was being accused of reading some perverted text or being charged with heresy. Everett shined his flashlight on his Bible. Okay. Exodus 4. God tells Moses to cast his rod on the ground and it turns into a snake. But this is when God is giving him his commission that one was for Moses, so he'd believe. Yeah. Then he throws it down as a sign to Pharaoh. Courtney stood holding the staff as if she were afraid of dropping it and the stick becoming a serpent. Everett held up a finger. Next we have Exodus 7.10. Aaron cast his rod down and it became a snake. Then in verse 19, Moses tells Aaron to strike the waters and turn them to blood. Everett flipped the page. Exodus 8, 5. God instructs Moses to tell Aaron to hold his rod over the water to summon the frogs. Are you serious? Courtney carefully leaned the staff against the wall of the cave and retrieved her Bible. But I wouldn't get around about the Bible. Everett scanned the page. Verse 17, and Aaron stretches out his rod and turns the dust into lice. Sarah joined the conversation. Well, what about the Red Sea? That was the rod of Moses. I know it for fact. Everett held up his hand as if to stop traffic. Ah, that's the Hollywood version, not the Bible. Everett thumbed past the pages. Exodus 14.21 Moses holds up his hands, and God causes the sea to part. Doesn't say anything about a rod or a staff. Same thing when the sea comes back on the Egyptians. God tells Moses just to stretch out his hands. Verses 26 and 27. Courtney flipped through her Bible, carefully studying the text. I can't believe I got all that wrong. Well, the devil has been making people think God's word says something it doesn't since the beginning of time. Eve in the garden, Satan comes to her and asks, Hath God said? And of course she gets it wrong. God said not to eat of the tree or they'd die. She comes back with, we can't eat it or touch it or we'll die. She started adding to God's word. Then Satan gets her to believe that God's word doesn't mean what it says. He tells her that she won't die. She believes him over God's word. And here we are, 6,000 years later, hiding out in a cave, avoiding the wrath of God. Why did you say it like that? Courtney crossed her arms. Say what? Everett sensed he was in trouble, but he wasn't sure why. Well, uh, of course she got it wrong. Her lips tightened. Oh, I'm sorry. Courtney crossed her arms. Say what? Everett sensed he was in trouble, but he wasn't sure for what. Of course she got it wrong. Her lips tightened. Because she was a woman. No, no. Everett shook his head and laughed. Look how many pastors were still here after the rapture. They were mostly all men. 
they got it wrong. I said, of course, because it is human to get it wrong. I'm sure I get lots of stuff wrong, but it's because I read it and then misinterpreted it for myself. I'm sure God will be much more tolerant of me than the people who got it wrong because they listened to some pastor who told them what they wanted to hear instead of studying the Bible for themselves. Aha! Uh -huh. I knew I wasn't crazy. Courtney looked up from her Bible. Check out Exodus 9.23. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. See, he used his rod. Sarah seemed to be distracted from her grief. She joined in also. Yep, 10.13. Also, listen to this. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. He used his rod. Maybe Courtney's right. Maybe we should take it to him. Everett quickly flipped through the pages. Okay. In both of those instances. Now back it up one verse. 9.22. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven. And 10.12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the land for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt. Maybe we're seeing a pattern here. Maybe Moses is beginning to change God's word in his head. Like I said, it's human to do so. I think you're making a mountain out of a molehill. Courtney closed her Bible. Well, maybe, and maybe not. Everett thumbed through his Bible. Now, in Exodus 17, God tells Moses to take his rod to the rock and Horeb, and strike the rock so water will come out. Now you're proving her point, Ceres said. Hang on. Everett flipped past several more pages. Turn to Numbers 20, verse 8. Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. Verse 11. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believed me not, then to sanctify me, in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Moses didn't get to go to the promised land because he smote the rock instead of speaking to it. The details of God's word are so important. And that's why I'm leery of the new translations. Courtney's brows tightened together. Everett, changing thee and thou into you and yours doesn't change the meaning of God's word. Jesus didn't speak in the king's English. He spoke Aramaic. If that's all they did, that would be fine. But to get a copyright, you have to change a certain amount of the text so it's significantly different. What if the translators ran out of these and nows and had to start making changes just to hit their quota for the copyright? It sounds dangerous to me. You could make the same argument over the King James. Sarah closed her Bible. Everett shrugged. There's no copyright on the King James. 
because of a little thing we like to call the American Revolution. Courtney pressed her lips together. Of course, none of them have an enforceable copyright under the Global Republic. They're all outlawed. Everett closed his Bible as well. Well, this is the one I trust. Westcott and Hort. The guys who headed up the translations for most of the newer versions didn't even believe it. Westcott didn't believe in the authority of the Bible, nor did he believe that it is infallible. Hort believed in evolution. Yeah, yeah, I heard Elijah talk about all of that, but the New King James and the MEV have nothing to do with those guys. They come from the same text as the King James. Courtney sounded like she was ready to keep going on the topic. Sarah seemed ready to change the subject. <clears throat> so we're not going to take Moses' staff? I don't think he needs it. He may have left it here on purpose. Maybe he thinks the thing has gotten him in enough trouble already. Everett felt mildly disappointed. He would have welcomed any excuse to get out of the Drury Cavern, but at the same time, he was in no hurry to expose his wife to unnecessary peril. Everett awoke early Saturday morning to the sound of Sarah stirring about the cave. He felt for his flashlight and turned it on momentarily to look at his watch. Huh. 4.30. He put his head down to go back to sleep. Sarah continued to move things around. Everett lay motionless, confident that she'd cease from her activities. <coughs> A minute later, he, gave, he got up from his slumber. Well, I'm wide awake now. He rolled over to see what all the commotion was about. Sarah stuffed clothing and MREs into her large military Alice pack, then placed Moses' staff into a large black duffel bag. Everett lifted his head off the pillow. That's strange. Why would she be doing that? When he saw her begin rolling up her sleeping bag, he got up and walked over to her. He whispered so not to wake Courtney. What's going on? Sarah shook her head. I've got to go. The statement caught Everett off guard. What? What? His response was louder than he intended it to be. Go where? Jerusalem. Everett looked at Moses' rod laying in the unzipped duffel. Is this about the staff? No. It's about me. I have to get out of here. I, I, I don't understand. Everett put his hand on her arm. Courtney awoke and got out of her sleeping bag. Why are you going to Jerusalem? Because there's nowhere else to go. Everett gripped her arm tight. That is a suicide mission, Sarah. Jerusalem is the new ground zero. With new Atlantis destroyed, Jerusalem will become the focus of the coming judgments. It's not a suicide mission, Everett. It's an anti-suicide mission. I know how I get. I mean, I can't sit here and stare at the empty walls of the cave. I'll just get more and more depressed until I can't take it anymore. I have to do something. I have to go somewhere. And there's nowhere else to go. This hemisphere is shot to pieces. I didn't particularly like the idea of sitting around here for the next three years waiting to die, and I still don't have any desire to do that. But with Kevin, yeah, I could have gotten by not without him. I can't do it. 
and no offense, but watching you two together just makes it that much harder. I have to go. I love you guys and I'll miss you, but I have to get out of here. I hope you'll understand. Courtney stood with her arms crossed. Her look of shock soon deteriorated into an expression of loss. Sarah, no, you can't leave us. We need you. It's only been four days since Kevin died. Give it some time. It'll get better. We'll make a point of getting outside every day. Winter's almost over. The weather will be mild. Maybe the rain will cleanse the soil and things will start to grow again. Please don't leave me. Courtney wrapped both arms around Sarah's neck and pulled her close. Sarah held her friend in the embrace for nearly a minute and then pulled away. I have to, Courtney. You don't know what it's like being all alone in this horrible cave. But you're not alone, Courtney pleaded. Sarah wiped a tear from her eye and then used her sleeve to dry the eyes of her friend. I have to do this. But I'll be with you in spirit. I'll never forget you guys. Courtney's voice grew more desperate. If you leave, you'll be alone. We won't be there for you, and it won't bring Kevin back. I'll find Elijah. Sarah packed several magazines for her AR-15. Courtney shook her head and turned to Everett. We have to do something. We can't let her leave. It's too dangerous. At a total loss for words, Everett lowered his gaze to Sarah's rifle. She's a grown woman. I can't physically restrain her. If her mind is set on leaving, we can't stop her. Then we'll go with her. Courtney didn't phrase the statement as a question. No. Everett grabbed Courtney's hand. We've worked very hard to put everything together so we can ride out the apocalypse right here in this cave. If, uh, if we leave, we walk away from all our provisions, all of our security. We have shelter, food, water. He pointed at the entrance of the cave. People are killing each other for those things out there. Well, I'm going with her. You can stay here with your provisions if you want. But Sarah needs us, and I'm going to be by her side. Courtney abruptly walked away and began packing a large frame backpack. Courtney, you absolutely are not going. Everett's eyes grew wide. She didn't turn away from her task. You can't stop me. You're going to leave me? He was stunned by her actions. She paused and let the pack fall over. She sat next to her belongings, silent and still, for several moments. Then she broke down and began to bawl. Everett pulled her close to his chest. Shh, it's all right. She took a deep breath and looked up. It's not all right. I won't leave you. You're my husband, but I won't be happy. I won't sleep knowing that Sarah is out there by herself. It'll just be the two of us. I love you, Everett. But we'll drive each other nuts being cooped up in here for three years alone. He bit his lower lip. He knew she was right. But he was in no way prepared to follow it through with the next statement that he blurted out of his mouth. Okay, we'll go with her. You mean it? Courtney's countenance changed in an instant. Immediately, he regretted what he'd just said. Sarah, can you give us a couple hours to pack some supplies? Sure, 
she ceased her activities. Everett looked around the cave. And we'll have to take some more supplies over to Cotton's mine than the ten buckets that had originally intended. Looks like they'll be keeping Sox in danger permanently. Whatever we do, it has to be done in one trip. The jeep has less than an eighth of a tank of gas. Courtney went through her belongings, selecting the few items she'd take on the journey. Sarah unrolled her sleeping bag and sat back down on the floor. She turned the radio on and listened to it at a low volume. Everett slowly began to pack his rucksack. Of all the supplies they had in the cave, he could only carry a few pounds worth. Everything in the cave was essential for survival. Choosing what to bring would be a monumental undertaking. Sarah held up the radio. I don't mean to sound ungrateful, but if you guys are coming with me, we've got to be gone by this time tomorrow. According to the GR press secretary, Thalia Jennings, Dragon will be back online in two days. We'll only have one day to get out of the country. Everett grunted. The added pressure didn't assist him in making the difficult decisions of what to bring and what to leave behind. Did, did you have an idea of how you're going to Jerusalem? No, Sarah said plainly. Well, they're not going to just let us walk onto a plane headed for the new GR capital. Everett picked up his HKG-36. The rifle was one item definitely on the take list. Maybe they'll let us walk right on? Courtney seemed to think it was a good plan. We could just make a fake mark with a sharpie. Everett shook his head. The mark is embedded Pico projector actually elevates the skin on the back of your hand slightly. He paused for a moment. Unless. What? Sarah let the radio rest on the ground while she waited for Everett to finish his sentence. Unless we actually implanted a deactivated Pico projector in our hands. They had a mobile implant gun in the MRAP that we took from the GR. Courtney dropped what she was doing. Seriously? You're considering taking the mark? Ha! <laughs> it's not the mark. Just a small piece of equipment that isn't activated. We would be connected to Dragon. We wouldn't have a GR number assignment. And most importantly, we wouldn't be taking the pledge to Luz. I'm not doing it. No way, no how. I don't care if it is deactivated. Courtney waved her hands in the air to express her adamant position on the matter. Sarah said, The Pico projector is about the size of a piece of rice. That, that, why couldn't we just sterilize a piece of rice and stick it under our skin? Oh, well, maybe. Everett considered the idea. And perhaps if we were dressed as peacekeepers, the authorities would pay less attention to our marks. Well, I don't know about that, Courtney frowned. Well, we have the uniforms from the skirmish on the way to Tommy's, Everett said. Tommy has the uniforms, Courtney clarified. He'll let us use them if it's for a good cause, Everett rebutted. Sarah looked at Courtney. Everett's right. We need a plan, and I can't think of anything better. It sounds risky. Courtney's brows pulled together. <laughs> this whole quest is risky. And if we get out of the country alive, 
people have successfully made it out of the frying pan and straight into the fire. I hope you both realize the level of absolute peril we're getting into here. Undeterred by the caveat, Courtney nodded. Okay. We'll pose as GR peacekeepers with grains of rice implanted under our skin. Sarah asked, From where? South Africa, mate. Courtney did a phenomenal South African accent. All right, then. Sarah tried her hand at the cadence. That sounds a little more Australian than South African, but we can work with it, Courtney chuckled. Everett continued packing. Hopefully, if we can pass as peacekeepers, our food and water will be supplied. Sarah looked at Everett's rifle. If we're going as South Africans, we'll have to use those vectors Tommy salvaged from Winchester. That means your G-36 will have to stay here. Everett collapsed the stock of the HK rifle and stowed it in his backpack. No one will ever know it's here. Careful. You don't let that gun turn into a security blanket like Moses' staff. I'd hate to see it get you in trouble, Courtney chided him. I think what we're all in more danger from that rod than this rifle. He looked up and glared at the smoothly carved piece of wood. It was that stupid stick that started all of this business about going to Jerusalem. Well, that's the trip. I, I admit I would not want to take. But what's Mike Goodwin going to do with these three? And when ladies get their minds made up, the show's over. And it is for today, but tomorrow we'll be back with Chapter 8.